What is going on guys? In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about the most important AWS services. And the motivation behind me making this video is that I've been talking to so many folks that some technical, some not, that want to get started learning AWS, or maybe they just want to do something specific with AWS, but they don't know where to start because there's so many different AWS services, so many different options to do the same thing. So it's really difficult for newcomers that may already know what they're trying to do. Sometimes they just don't know which services they need to use. Uh, so if that sounds familiar, or if you're just getting started learning AWS, then this video is going to be for you. And the way I'm going to explain it to you in this video is I'm going to take a hypothetical example of making a web app that requires some APIs and requires some databases and analytics tools. And I'm going to explain to you all the AWS services that are required to make that happen through this example. Uh, so hopefully by the end of it, you're going to learn about a lot of different AWS services. You're going to know generally in broad strokes what they do. And if you're trying to solve a particular problem in one of these domains, you're going to know which service you need to start looking at. Uh, so that's what the agenda is for this video. So like I said, we're going to be talking about an example in this video. And the example we're going to use is you're trying to host a web application that has some APIs, has some databases, uh, analytics tool, monitoring, security, all those kind of basic layers of a well-designed application. So let's walk through the different steps. Uh, so the first thing that we have here is we just have our user that's interacting with a browser and they need to uh, hit our website. So where do we start? Where do we host this website? Um, so the first answer to that is you know static content. We need a way to host our JavaScript files, host our CSS, host our HTML, our images, SVGs, all that kind of stuff for our application. And the service that we want to use to hold and store just some raw objects of varying sizes, just a, an all-purpose kitchen sink service just to store raw objects. That's Amazon S3, stands for Simple Storage Service. It is one of the oldest AWS services, and it's great for just kind of like I said, being the kitchen sink, a place where you just store different objects of different sizes and things called S3 buckets. Uh, so this is where you would store your JavaScript, your CSS, all that kind of static content for your application. And so your next logical step is, okay, I have S3, I'm hosting these files now. I want to speed up performance. I want to ensure that if my users are accessing this application from anywhere in the world, they're going to get optimal performance. Uh, so the way that you would do that at a caching layer is to use Amazon CloudFront. And CloudFront natively can hook up to Amazon S3. So if you store your, your assets in S3, you can just put a CloudFront layer in front of it. And then all of a sudden you have caching, so edge caching, where nodes are distributed all across the world, close to where customers are going to access your website from. So using CloudFront in conjunction with S3 is going to allow you to optimize latency for access to your application. So far, so good. Everything's working pretty well. Uh, now we want to actually register our domain and set up our DNS and all that. And that's where Amazon Route 53 comes in. That's going to allow us to register our domains. It's going to allow us to set our DNS settings, uh, build our API routes, everything like that in terms of domain management is going to happen in the Route 53 service of AWS. That sounds good. So the next thing we want to do is actually host some APIs. We want to you know, have a REST API where we're going to be able to call our uh, React website from and say, hey, go get me some data REST API. Uh, so thankfully, there's a whole bunch of different options. And this is sometimes where people get lost because there's different ways of accomplishing the same things on AWS. And this is kind of what I want to show you now. So if you're looking for a solution that is in the space of serverless computing, so you don't need to worry about uh, infrastructure or hosts or you know making sure hosts are up at the right time, having alarms on that stuff, then this is going to be the solution for you. And the first solution that I have for you here is API Gateway, Amazon API Gateway plus AWS Lambda. So AWS Lambda is the serverless service, like I said. Uh, you don't worry about machines. You only worry about uploading code. And then AWS Lambda is going to be responsible for scaling scaling your application, provisioning machines uh, on your behalf, and deploying code whenever traffic comes in so that those machines can host your applications. Uh, all of this, those details that I just mentioned, like deploying machines, finding, provisioning, that's all hidden from you. So you don't have to worry about any of that. The 
only thing that you have to worry about is just deploying some code, uploading it to AWS Lambda, registering a function, and you're done. Basically, you just invoke your Lambda function, and it can serve as a RESTful endpoint if you combine it with API Gateway. Uh, so you can define your own REST endpoints using Route 53 plus API Gateway, and then forward those requests from the API Gateway to the Lambda function. And then bang, you just got a REST API very, very quickly, very, very easily with minimum configuration. So that's the first option for API hosting. Um, I wanna go through two other options really quick because they're important as well. And the option that you choose is usually dependent on your use case. And by the way, I have a whole bunch of videos on all these topics that I'm about to describe. I'm gonna put them in the description section below. Uh, so the next one is using an application load balancer plus Amazon EC2. Um, so let's start with EC2 first. So EC2 is, again, a very, very old service, it stands for Elastic Cloud Compute. And it's a service that you basically rent machines from AWS. You, you rent virtual machines that you can spin up or spin down with a set amount of resources at any time. And with these EC2s, you can do whatever you want. So combine this with a framework like Nginx, then you can host some REST APIs just by using EC2s. Now, if you wanna scale that out a little bit more, you wanna add more nodes. So you know your, your application's growing very quickly. You wanna add more computers so that you can um, serve all that traffic that's coming in. Then you can add an application load balancer in front of that and have kind of a, a load balancer that'll delegate traffic to all the different machines that are in your cluster. Uh, so that's another option as well. It gives you more flexibility, more control in terms of how you want your machines managed. And the third option is for you folks that like Docker. I know Docker is very popular right now. So what the third option involves is ALB, Application Load Balancer, plus Amazon ECS. And ECS stands for Elastic Container Store. And this is where you're gonna be hosting your Docker images. So with ECS, you create a Docker image, you upload that to another service called Elastic Cloud Repository. And that's kind of the, the hub of uh, where your images are stored. And then you can use ECS to kind of manage your cluster. You can tell it, hey, I always want five compute nodes of my Docker image up at all times. And ECS will be responsible for making sure they're up, making sure they're healthy, make sure they're passing health checks, uh, monitors and alarms are going to be run against them, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different options here. And by the way, I have videos on almost all of these topics. And I'm going to put that in the description section below so that you can check them out and watch them whenever you want. So to recap, so far, we have our application, we have our, our domain set up, and we have our API. And now we want to add our database layer. So we have our database over here. So there's SQL and NoSQL as options. So I'm going to go through both just to talk about some of the options, not in detail, just generally. Uh, so the first most popular SQL option is, of course, Amazon RDS. It stands for Relational Database Service. Uh, you have two options in terms of hosting your um, SQL application here. The first one is using the unmanaged solution. Um, so in this, in the unmanaged solution, you can use RDS to host like MySQL databases, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, Oracle, all those kind of standard applications. AWS will host them on their platform for you. However, in the unmanaged service, um, you need to worry about things like if you want to add read replicas or if you want to add multiple nodes to scale out your application further. Uh, you need to do that manually. It also requires a little bit more maintenance and management to ensure that the database is always working correctly and staying healthy. So there's a little bit more management there. Now the managed solution is, I would say, the more popular solution. And this is kind of your one-click uh, kind of solution where everything is managed for you. You set up the database, AWS hosts it for you. They ensure that it stays in a healthy state, ensure that it's passing health checks, ensure that everything is going swimmingly. It takes backups for you as well. There's a whole bunch of extras that you get if you use the managed solution. Of course, it costs a little bit more and they even have a serverless option too. Uh, so that's called Amazon Aurora on RDS. So if you're interested in the managed solution, that's what you're looking for. So the other main database, uh, more on the lines of BI, business intelligence, uh, but I figured I'd put it here because it does kind of belong in the database section, is Amazon Redshift. And again, you can have like a cluster of machines in Amazon, Amazon Redshift. And what it's designed for is more for very heavy duty BI style queries and analytics style queries, where you're doing very large joins, maybe time series analysis, um, very large queries with hundreds, if not thousands of rows. So that's more of what it's aimed for, but it's more on the lines of business 
business intelligence. I have a separate section for BI tools, but I figured I'd put this here because it is a SQL database after all. Now, if you're looking for a SQL database option, by far the most popular is of course, Amazon DynamoDB. DynamoDB is your standard NoSQL key value database that scales horizontally, uh, very fast performance, very easy to use, very, very popular as well, a lot of applications. A lot of businesses are going with DynamoDB these days. Uh, it's gonna be a cert, like if you're, if you're using NoSQL, you should definitely be looking at DynamoDB. Uh, the other option in terms of caching is Amazon Elastic Cache. So it supports a whole bunch of different um, frameworks. So Memcache, Redis, and a couple other ones as well. Um, so this is for all purpose caching, again, key value kind of lookups. Um, but if you're using stuff like Redis, you can do more interesting lookups um, in that case. So that's, uh, that's it for caching. And the third option is just to show some of the diversity. There's a whole bunch of different services, by the way, in the NoSQL category. Um, like there's another time series one that's ideal for like time range style lookups. Uh, Amazon Neptune is the graph database where, you know, kind of your face, classic Facebook connection problem where maybe your data is consists of nodes and connections between nodes. Then Amazon Neptune is probably what you're going to want to go for. Um, so the next problem or the next kind of category is application orchestration. And for this, the two services that you want to use are SNS and SQS. And what I mean by application coordination or application orchestration is if you're building a service oriented architecture, so you want different services to communicate with one another, then you would use SNS and SQS to communicate with each other asynchronously. Uh, not going to go into too much detail on this. I have a great video on SNS versus SQS. So if you're unsure about when to use what, go check it out. I'll put it in the description. And another one that's really useful in my experience is AWS step functions and step functions allow you to do things like like workflow processing like for example if you're placing an order on a website there's a whole bunch of sequence of things that need to happen like ensure that your payment criteria or your credit card is valid ensure that your pin is valid uh, charge the card only after the card is charged successfully you pack the order and ship it so that kind of sequential thing um, that's where step functions are useful uh, now the next one is in terms of analytics, um, big data, machine learning, all that kind of stuff. And there's a whole bunch of different services here that are useful in this category. So the first one, which is quickly gaining popularity is Amazon Athena. And Amazon Athena is, is a serverless option to perform analysis with giant queries that you can do on data that is stored in S3. Uh, so this is where Athena is really attractive. You can use just your standard SQL in order to perform form lookups on data that is stored in Amazon S3. It's very great because S3 is a perfect solution for storing your data very cost effectively. So you can just keep your data in S3 and use Athena to access it. Uh, there's a couple trade-offs that you need to be aware of when you're using it. It's not gonna be optimal in terms of performance necessarily, but it's great if you're looking to kind of save a few bucks. Alternatively, um, the, the other option for that is Redshift, which is a more persistent, reliable analytics tool uh, for performing analysis using SQL on large sets of data. And you can combine Athena with a service called Amazon QuickSight. And Amazon QuickSight is like Tableau or Power BI, if you know what those tools are. It allows you to hook up into these different um, data sources that exist on AWS and you know graph them, chart them, build dashboards, that kind of stuff. Uh, and the next one is Amazon EMR, which stands for Elastic MapReduce. Uh, so you know, if you're looking to do MapReduce jobs, this is what you're going to be using. And if you're interested in the world of machine learning, then AWS or Amazon SageMaker is the choice for you. It allows you to build, train, and deploy machine learning models. Uh, so if you're into machine learning, that's what you want to know. Now, I've omitted two main sections, which are over here, which I consider to be some of the most important sections of this video. Uh, and the first one, is security. Unfortunately, this is often very neglected, especially for people that are just getting started learning AWS. And security is probably one of the most important things because if a person gains access to your AWS account, they could potentially do things that rack up giant bills on your credit card. So you always need to make sure your application is secure, both in, both in terms of your credentials, so your access tokens, and also in terms of vulnerabilities that exist on your system, for example, like open ports. Um, so the first one that you want to use is Amazon VPC. And VPC stands for Virtual Private Cloud. Very, very important service. 
Uh, so with VPC, what you can do is kind of build a digital firewall around your AWS ecosystem or your AWS resources. And this digital firewall ensures that your resources are separate from other people's resources. It allows you to define rules such as, I only accept traffic on this port from this particular group of machines. So you can lock down your architecture such that you define when and how different applications can access retrieve data or make outbound calls to the public internet and to other groups within your um, firewall as well. So VPC is very important for locking down your AWS ecosystem. Now, if you sign up for your AWS account for the first time, you're gonna have a default VPC, which is very liberal in terms of its settings. But if you're serious about AWS, you wanna host an application and you wanna make sure that it is locked down, nothing is getting in or out, you wanna use VPC and you wanna get comfortable with some of the concepts like subnets, like route tables, like internet gateways, things like that. Uh, the second one that is also just as important is AWS identity and access management. Uh, now this is the thing that you attach to different resources. So you say like this Lambda function has access to DynamoDB or this Lambda function has access to these APIs on a specific table of DynamoDB and no other. So these are the kinds of things that you can do with IAM. There's a couple different concepts in IAM, such as users, roles, policies, permissions. Uh, I have a whole video on this, so if you don't know about IAM, you should probably go watch that because it explains all these things in detail. These are kind of the mid-tier entities that you use that define which permission you as a user or a uh, entity in AWS has access to. Uh, so that's identity and access management, or IAM for short. Now the last and final section is monitoring. I find that monitoring unfortunately gets the short end of the stick in terms of the glory, but I wanna make sure that I talk about it here because monitoring is important for making sure your service stays up, it stays reliable, stays healthy, and you're always able to serve traffic. So the first service that is very, very important in terms of monitoring is Amazon CloudWatch. And I would consider Amazon CloudWatch as a kind of umbrella service. There's a whole bunch of different independent subservices within CloudWatch, so it's really, Really, really powerful. Uh, it should probably have five different um, icons here instead of just one. But it allows you to do things like monitoring, so set up uh, graphs and set up alarms on on a metric that maybe establishes or determines the health of your service. It allows you to do things like look at logs, so you can create log groups that group your log files together so you can look at them in a much more clean and cohesive way. It allows you to set up things like cron jobs, kind of they're called CloudWatch events in AWS, but it's effectively the same thing where you have kind of a monotonically ringing event that triggers some other service. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into Amazon CloudWatch, also dashboards so that you can ensure that your service is always running in a predictable way. Uh, so there's a whole lot in CloudWatch, and I just wanna emphasize how important that service is if you're trying to maintain or trying to build an application that's going to be scalable and healthy at all times. And the final one is AWS CloudTrail, and this is useful for kind of just auditing who is doing what on your application, especially useful if you're kind of in a uh, ecosystem where you have just a handful of AWS accounts and many, many users, you wanna keep track of who's doing what. Uh, CloudTrail is kind of an audit table or an audit service that logs who is accessing what and when, so you can kind of look it up later. Um, so these are what I consider to be the most important AWS services. As I mentioned, I have a whole bunch of videos on all these different topics. I'm gonna put them down in the description section below so that you can check it out. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.